So thanks very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here back physically in Japan. So I will speak about flying robots and some of the journey we did in the nearly last 20 years on developing flying platforms for different type of applications, but also the, fly, the basic flying concepts. So flying robots, for those who are probably a little bit younger generation, they think that's around forever, but it took, it's not so, um, it's still pretty recent. Today we have uh, millions of flying platforms which are sold for taking images also in the private sector uh, from the air. But um, uh, the flying robots, like the multicopters we see today, uh, were only able to, to generate them by having micro IMUs, which allow really to control them, um, to have the powerful calculators on board, and of course also some different um, elements which allowed them to have autonomous navigation. So the quadrotor con concept with four propellers is older than 20 years, but it was not feasible to do this and implement this. And we were happy to really be among the first showing that you can fly with four propellers and uh, using an IMU to, co to stabilize this in the air. This was around 2004 when I was still at EPFL. And it turned out uh, later on, we realized it's the first time that a quadrotor was flying um, in the free air. And you can see even the PhD students um, some year um, was also having some collision avoidance with ultrasound on board. Quadrotor turned also out, turned out to be very dynamic. And uh, there is some very fasc fascinating work which was done uh, around 2009-10 by Raf de Andreas uh, group uh, at ETH, where they have shown that quadrotors can really do very dynamic maneuver, handing over, for example, the stick, actually moving parts around and building um, structures. So it became really a fascinating tool for on one side taking images, but on the other side also for really pushing uh, further the um, research and especially control and perception uh, in this field. Now, these quadrotors, um, in the beginning, they were able to fly probably about two or three minutes. Later on, they flew a little bit longer, but we know that helicopter or rotary wing flight uh, capabilities are still limited by their the, the efficiency. Here you can see a slide which was uh, put together by um, Fraundorfer Aerospace, um, which, are working, which is working actually on an auto gear. And you can see that quadrotor or multicopters have an efficiency which is represented here by cost of transportation, meaning the watt hours per kilogram and kilometer um, for transportation um, is about 10 times less efficient than a fixed wing airplane. So if you really want to do large environment uh, mapping, for example, from the air, you cannot do this with um, rotor wing airplanes. Uh, it applies the same thing actually for transporting people from A to B, helicopters and rotor wing systems are really not very efficient. This actually motivated us after, after our work in um, multicopters to look into more efficient ways to fly with small aer aerial vehicles. And so we looked mainly at the design and modeling and, and optimization. And so one of the first elements we looked at, can we probably fly forever with a fixed wing airplane, which has solar cells on the wing. Um, we demonstrated in 2008, the first time that you can really fly in continuous mode. So you charge the batteries, which are distributed in the wing um, uh, during day, and then you fly overnight. We pushed this further and we came up with a um, solar airplane, which has about six meter wingspan, has uh, about six kilogram of total weight. Half of it is batteries. Um, which can then be used, for example, to <coughs> do inspection of flights in Greenland. Now, there we were in a mission with um, Earth scientists to fly hundreds of kilometers out um, to take images from the glaciers there. If you want to do this, otherwise, today it would be with um, human piloted fly, uh, air, uh, airplanes, which is very cost costly because you have to transport all the fuel up there and everything. And I think drones will offer here very new um, capabilities to actually discover and survey our Earth also in very remote places. 
these airplanes are extremely optimized for lightweight and they have an efficiency so that you can fly the whole day, you can fly overnight, and if you have a sunny day, you can have an extra of about five to six hours of flight time, so you can fly even at somewhat cloudy days. Now, these airplanes are somewhat not very robust, they're very sensitive, you need um, to take off and land, uh, you have a takeoff by really shooting it in the air and landing on a flat ground, and so we had then the vision to have something which actually can take off like a helicopter, which is uh, wonderful because you know, don't need a, um, a special environment, but still have the efficiency of a fixed wing airplane. And uh, this resulted in this VTOL, we call it the Bertel the Takeoff and Landing System, which is now a company, um, Vingtra, um, which combines actually a, f a wing only system with two propellers and two flaps. This is the minimalistic solution actually to control it during takeoff and landing in the vertical mode and then go over to the fixed wing mode. In contrast to a multicopter, these systems can fly much longer and they can also cover a much bigger space because you fly at higher speed and still being very efficient. So you fly about one hour with this airplane and you can still more or less uh, have the same uh, simple de uh, deployment of the system um, by having a vertical takeoff and landing. We did a lot of additional work there to actually control the system, even with strong wind, which is uh, somewhat delicate because the, this big wing, wing is actually during takeoff and landing really um, deviating by wind gusts, but um, you can still do this uh, with pretty high wind uh, with appropriate controllers. Now, we know from, from the nature or from uh, humans that in principle, you can also fly even without additional propulsion units on the airplane, which is done by glider pilots. And we were then wondering how can we best actually use the energy from the environment um, to have a more optimal and a long, longer duration of flights. So in our environment, on one side, we have updrifts from thermals, and on the other side, we have also wind-induced um, updrifts by the, in, the topology of the environment and the general flow of the, the winds uh, in the environment. Now, in order to use this best, uh, the drone has to know about this um, wind situations um, in order to do an optimal trajectory planning which is not so obvious because you have to know this in real time on board and calculate this ideally on board, especially if you don't have a very large, uh, easy way to um, do this uh, off board. So um, you know all that um, aerodynamic calculations is quite extensive. Um, you have on one side typically easy access to the topology of the environment and on the other side you have also typically probably reasonable access to weather prediction or special wind prediction. Now, by co combining these two informations, our goal was to actually do a real-time onboard estimation of the wind fields in the environment. So taking in the general information about potential wind from weather prediction and the topology of the environment. Now, in order to then do this in real time, you cannot do uh, fluid dynamics or computational fluid dynamics, because this takes a lot of calculation power. But you can use um, CFD as actually the input for learning uh, through a deep neural network, the, the, the fields, uh, the wind fields in the environment. Um, and if you do this, you can then much easier in real time on board actually calculate the fields and then use this in your trajectory and pass planning on board the system. So you can see here the input from CFD and then the prediction of the neural network. And you can see that it's pretty good already. Of course, there is always some situation where it's uh, more difficult, but in general, I think it's good enough uh, that we can use this for somewhat an optimal trajectory planning. So with most of our research, we are not doing this only in, in simulation, but we want to do this really experiment this in real world environment. So we went um, with four or three airplanes in an environment where you have actually, you can predict these wind uh, um, situations. And then actually the three fixed wing airplanes can also share their information 
um, to get an optimal estimate of the wind situation in the environment. This is in Switzerland at the Chasserelle. We have, we have three airplanes with a lot of wind there. So there is the wind prediction on one side, so which allows the airplanes to have an optimal flight so that they actually don't need any energy to stay in the air in most uh, of the time uh, during these flights. And they can also share their information so that they can actually optimize their prediction based on real um, time measurements of winds of the other, the other airplanes. So this is an additional element so to have long duration flight, which actually always pushed us to um, go further and see how long we can fly and, and be in the air. Now, up to now, flying platforms are still somewhat limited to fly in environments where you don't have obstacles. And typically you try to be as far away from um, structures and obstacles. Now imagine if you could fly actually much closer or probably even interact with the environment. And this was actually the ne next motivation and the next research we, we started to have a system which can actually flying platforms, flying the robots, which can actually interact with the environment. For doing so, you need first of all an omnidirectional um, flying platform, meaning that you have um, you ha are fully activated or even overactuated. Typical airplanes, even fix, fixed wing and rotary wings, are underactuated, meaning that if you want to fly um, forward, you have to tip um, the, the, the system forward. So you can actually then not so easily control forces in all directions. Now, our basic system to do this, that we have a nominational controllable system, is that we have, in this case, six propellers. And these propellers, you can rotate around the central axis. So this allows you to have really full control, um, meaning that you can, for example, have the system rotating around the central axis without translation, or actually do translation, x, y translation, without rotation. This is probably not useful if you just want to take images from the air, but it becomes extremely useful or actually important, otherwise you will probably fail if you want to have interaction with the environment. And here you can see actually a simple uh, first example how you can interact. So in this case, we have this omnidirectional system which just has a pin or pen which is, the, uh, is attached at the system. And we generate a force against this whiteboard and we do a movement in X, Y parallel to the whiteboard. And in this way, you can, with this omnidirectional flying platform, actually write on a whiteboard without additional elements. Or, of course, you can then do the next step, do, for example, some contact-based measurements on infrastructures where you, on one side, you have uh, this uh, possibility to apply a certain force towards the surface, and move along the surface, but you have then also, of course, to in real time to um, reconstruct the environment to, uh, for this movement. Now, these omnidirectional platforms um, have the potential to really allow really fully force control or wrench control. So if you want to, for example, generate a movement along a trajectory, you have on one side the estimate of the movement of the platform um, and then you have the tra tra trajectory plan which is what you want to do and then you generate actually a six degree of freedom trajectory controller now this um, generates then a wrench which is the force acting on the on the plat which is expected to um, act on the platform the force and torque and then you need a so-called allocation matrix which actually um, allocates the wrench you define for following a trajectory to the different propellers. And we have typically even overactuated systems, so in a way you can even optimize there. You find the best allocation coming from the wrench towards the different propeller speed and orientation of the propeller. So by doing so, we have on one side um, the part which is the trajectory and controller, which is agnostic to the morphology of the system. So it doesn't depend if you have six or eight propellers or only four propellers, as long as it's omnidirectional and you can really generate a wrench. And then you have this um, specific uh, element, the allocation matrix, which is dependent on the morphology of, of your system. 
So if you do so, you can start to really move uh, very precisely in, in very um, special situations. So this is a free flight where you where the, the flying platform is flying in a uh, figure of eight. And you can see, actually, you can follow very precisely this figure of eight because you have a full control of all orientation and uh, position in the system, which would, of course, not be possible with a, another system. Now, free flight, as mentioned before, is probably not the most exciting part of this omnidirectional flying platform, um, but it's more interesting to really do go in interaction. We have already seen we can actually apply a certain force to a surface by doing so, for so, doing so, what you can, for example, do is directly have an impedance controller. This impedance controller is actually having an, um, a, a compliance towards the surface, for example, and then probably have a position control in parallel to the surface. You just replace the trajectory controller by an impedance controller, and you have, this, again, the same allocation matrix as you can see it in, on this slide. So um, there is still a couple of challenges with these omnidirectional platforms. You have seen that the main propellers are rotating around the center axis. So they will, for example, um, have uh, inf an influence uh, aerodynamics on each other. So one prop propeller is flowing in, uh, giving flow in the other propellers. We have the tilt rotor dynamics, which is smaller or slower, um, less bandwidth than the rotational speed change. We have black clashes in the joints uh, and, and some uh, param um, model parameter errors. In order to further improve this, we actually then worked with a, um, uh, with a hybrid control model using active learning. So we add on the basic model of the Omnidirectional um, platform um, a Gaussian process learned residual, which really learns the result residual dynamics. This allows us really to be more precise um, and to go even further. And this is shown here uh, as results. On, on the left side, you have the system with uh, the estimate of the residual um, dynamics. And on the uh, right side, you have uh, the standard system. And you can see actually you can reduce, in this case, by a factor of two roughly, the jaw acceleration and have a much smoother movement. So we are still continuing to work on this, and I'm convinced that we can even go further, that really you can get rid of most of these um, uh, unmodeled elements by just learning them in different flight uh, situations. So once you have this omnidirectional um, uh, flight platform, all of a sudden you have really a tool. You can not only fly in the free air, but you can fly in interaction with the in environment. And of course, one way to interact with the environment is through having feeling force by tactile, tactile interaction with the environment. For demonstrating this, we actually combine a robot arm, a force control uh, robot arm, um, with a flying platform, where the robot arm is not is only used as a tactile feedback system, and uh, so where you can fly with your flying platform and then really feel the interaction force with the environment by just only using these omnidirectional capabilities of, of the flying platform. So this uh, opens, of course, the way for doing interaction at height, um, interaction with, with the environment, and uh, go, for example, to fix something at height, or at least take measurements at height. Now, if this is not enough, because you still have some remaining jiggling around of the main platform, because this is uh, because you, the, the force you can generate is somewhat an aerodynamic force, and so you can very often not be in a precision of less than probably a, a centimeters at the end factor. But if you combine this with, uh, for example, a delta robot in this case, where you have a much higher dynamics, where you can compensate with the delta robot actually this, uh, this movement of the base platform, you can actually generate end effector position accuracy, which is in the order of a couple of millimeters. And this was actually the goal by adding this delta robot on the platform. Um, so you still have a nominal platform, but then you have a delta robot, which has uh, three degrees of freedom X, Y, and Z, which can compensate actually the, the rest of the, the system. And if you combine this, you can see on the left side, 
the fixed manipulator, so in principle you are not trying to compensate and on the right side you have an active manipulator which compensates actually for the errors of the, the platform. And you can see that the, the base um, has still similar errors because these are depending on this aerodynamic interaction with the environment and it's still uh, pretty high of a couple of, of uh, centimeters. But on the other side, here on the right side, you can see that with the end effector, with this uh, parallel robot arm, which is very highly dynamic, you can compensate and you can actually have an end effector um, error, which is much smaller um, in the order of sub millimeter, uh, sub micrometer, uh, centimeter resolution. So for these flying platforms, um, it's of course first important to have the right design, but of course they have also to um, have the appropriate uh, sensing and uh, navigation system so that you can do autonomous navigation in the environment. So we started actually in parallel um, a lot of work on visual navigation. Visual navigation is probably the best way to go for flying platform because you have very limited payload and also le very limited power. So uh, our work, which um, we use then also for uh, ground-based robots, for bigger robots, start, uh, started actually for flying platform with feature tracking and, and visual um, motion tracking. So you track, in principle, uh, it's well known today that you track um, features from one image to the other. And if you do this, you can actually, for example, learn with a tablet or today's smartphone, you just build a map of features of the environment. So this tablet is actually measuring how this human is moving around. So you have in red the, the trajectory, which is measured by the motion estimation. And in parallel, the features are actually built, are building uh, a map of the environment. So a feature map of the environment, which is for us humans not so easy to read, but for robots easy to, to look at. And these are is the, the results or the yellow po points are the features, which are the basis for the map and the green line is the trajectory. And now you can give over this to a system which has the same senses, which means a camera and an eye view, and then a flying platform can exactly do the same movement. So this is what we call teach and repeat. You just teach the system by a human moving around with a tablet, making a map and, and collecting movement, and then repeating this by a robot, and in this case, it's a flying platform. Now, this is not enough actually to do full uh, navigation and useful task in a lot of uh, environment. So you not need much more. We know from robotics that we, of course, we need in navigation, we need uh, perception first, then we need uh, motion estimation very often, we need uh, 3D mapping in dense and uh, so probably feature-based maps. You need the planning, which is also a challenge. And it's especially challenging if you want to do this on a flying platform, where you have limited uh, perception system, you have limited uh, calculation power. So you can see here on one side uh, the inputs uh, where we have typically cameras and sometimes also RGBD with the depth information, where you then build up a 3D dense map, which is required to do the collision avoidance. You build up in parallel probably some, some feature-based map for localization and you need then to do the real-time onboard planning. I don't want to go in detail for this, but we are putting all these elements together in our research, and which allows us at the end actually to use only a single camera and the IMU, which is anyway on, on a flying platform, to do um, autonomous navigation without prior knowledge in forest environment. So on the left and the right side on the bottom, you can see how the system builds up a 3D map of the environment by a single camera and the IMU information, and which then automatically also tries to plan the best trajectory. The goal which is given to the flying platform here is only just move through 100 meters straight forward through the forest. And forest is especially challenging because you have a lot of little branches which the system has to see and to avoid. You can see how this uh, 3D dense map is built up online. Um, in parallel, you have feature-based tracking so that you have a precise motion estimation. And then you have the yellow line, which shows you the online calculation of the next uh, the planning um, in advance. Um, you can, of, of course, only plan as far as the system already has a 3D map um, because you have no information after the environment from there. 
Now, once you want to fly um, along surfaces, it's getting a little bit more difficult actually to do um, optimal trajectory planning because you would like very often to fly along a surface. For doing so, we actually um, you, we are using a, um, a Romanian uh, motion planner, which allows us to transform really whatever environment towards a, a surface following system, which allows us to um, easily then follow the surface, always, for example, rectangular to the surface. And this is um, uh, needed if you want, for example, to do measurements along the surface, or you probably just want to spray a surface which is not flat. So this will enable, I think, flying platforms to really be very uh, dynamic and very um, efficient by um, fixing, measuring, spraying, or actually um, uh, cleaning surfaces. Now, for fixed-wing airplanes, um, you typically want to have a view for far, far ahead because you have much, much, much fly, uh, fasting, uh, flying much faster than with rotary wing, which were typically it's good enough you have, uh, if you have a view of about 10 meters. Now, how can you actually see probably a couple hundred meters um, without having very expensive and very heavy lasers on board? Fixed-wing airplanes have the advantage that they have the wings. And imagine if you have two cameras at the tip of the wing, you have a pretty big um, baseline. Big baseline means that you can actually have a, a good zero vision um, to a distance up to a couple hundred meters. But the wings are flexible, so um, you have to compensate for the movement of the wings. So this um, system here, what we propose, is having no lasers and no expensive uh, other sensors, but only three cameras, two at the tip of the wing and one in the center. But in order to compensate for the, the flexibility of the wing, you need additionally an eye mu with each camera, which allows you to estimate actually the movement, the relative movement. So you have always a control of, of, uh, over the baseline. And if you do this correctly, you all of a sudden have a, a tool or a sensor system which allows to up to a couple hundred meters to reconstruct in 3D the environment. And a couple hundred meters is good enough for small drones, fixed wing drones, which actually um, fly with roughly about 10 meters per second. This allows these systems still to do collision avoidance. You can see here the two inputs and then the 3D map, which is reconstruction. Now, let me, at the end, also show a little bit where we are today and what are typical or interesting applications, especially for flying platforms which can interact with the environment. We all know that heavy infrastructure like bridges, but also big buildings, they have been constructed starting after the Second World War in around 1950. Most of these infrastructures uh, which have been built then are getting somewhat old have to need maintenance, need regular inspection, so that we don't have disasters, bridges collapsing, which we have seen in a couple of uh, the last years. Now, for inspection of these uh, buildings and structures, it's very difficult to reach there. Either you have to have a scaffold or you have to have people on ropes to do the measurements. We are convinced that Flying Platform can do a lot of this work, um, give us um, a good access to inspecting bridges, and to know about the situation and the, of the different structures. So there is one collaboration we had recently with some people from um, some group, research group at ETH from civil engineers, where they have shown that by using measuring this potential of electric field in concrete, you can actually get a very good information about the steel and the corro potential corrosion of the reinforcement steel in a concrete uh, bridge. Um, and so you, what you need to have there is actually a sensor which is connected to the concrete and you need to close the loop with an electric field um, which uh, can be done with a tether. This can be done with humans, but then they have to be on ropes. And we demonstrated that this can be done actually with a flying platform. First in the lab, um, again, here we have this omnirational uh, flying platform which allows us really to apply a constant and a 
reasonably high force towards the um, environment. And we have shown that this is then al allows us to really have a good measurement of what the status of the uh, reinforcement seal is in the bridge. Then we did the same thing in on a real bridge um, in order to demonstrate. Of course, here it's still somewhat in a research setting. You can see we, re we um, fixed the, the, the drone with the rope so that uh, in case, but um, we, I think it shows really that this has a lot of potential. I would like to end my presentation with um, two videos showing a little bit what is today feasible. So a lot of this research we did over the last uh, 20 years has also made it to market. For example, with Wingtra, which is now a company in Zurich, which is uh, delivering all over the world this um, uh, vertical takeoff and landing drones, which are fixed wing but can vertically take off and land. And this allows, for example, to take a map from the city of Zurich by just having one camera, a high resolution camera, combined with a very precise motion estimation, uh, including our RTK GPS. This uh, city of Zurich of about 800 acres um, can be mapped in about uh, three centimeters resolution, only about six hours. So you fly over the city, you have a couple of flights, you collect the data, using the precise motion estimation, you have in a very short time, a fully 3D map of the environment. Of course, this information can then be um, uh, treated uh, later on uh, to every even more uh, geometric models, for example, of the environment. So the second element is um, this Omniactual Drones, which is a company, a startup company from ETH, which is a little bit younger, with the goal to replace these guys hanging on ropes. There is a lot of danger with these drops on one side, and probably the most uh, critical element is that uh, most often you have to switch off all these installations. So if you have a chimney, you cannot have people on ropes as long as the chim chimney is somewhat hot or whatever. We want to replace these workers by drones and these omnireactional drones, which can uh, more or less do the same thing. They can apply forces. Um, they can actually be also show that we can even drill holes at, at height. And here you can see a little bit of, of a glimpse of this platform, which can go and, and um, interact with the environment in all directions. And here, for example, we have even a tool to grind off the, the surface to fix, for example, um, corrosion on, on a structure. With this, I would like to summarize, we, in the last two decades, drone technology has evolved from research from different labs all over the world to a fast growing market. I tend to say that drones is probably the market robotics field which has fastest developed in the last um, 20 years. Why is this probably, the, uh, was this possible? I think it's mainly because free flying drones is much, much easier than having interactive robots on the ground working in our kitchen. So we can today, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of robots doing aerial imaging, helping in agriculture and forestry, uh, doing search and rescue for a certain rescuing team, um, and uh, more and more also aerial inspection and maintenance. I think there is still a lot of work and research to be done so that this um, system have really fully on board 3D um, reconstruction capabilities uh, so that they can fly in, in very dense space inside and outside, which is uh, a big challenge. Um, I think the physical interaction with flying platform has opens a wonderful new ways uh, how to use these systems, but um, is of course also still um, a challenge for a lot of uh, different applications. We need sense and avoid on board um, for being really which is a, a very important element that these drones can be seamlessly um, integrated in the public airspace, um, which is I think, still a challenge and we will have uh, more probably restrictions in the future to fly drones. With this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for your uh, interest and I'm happy to answer questions. Of course, all this work was done by a big team behind a lot of uh, support from different funding agents and, and partners. Thanks very much. So, uh, 
Thank you, Roland, uh, for this excellent and uh, very interesting talk on flying robots addressed in both the underlying uh, technologies and also uh, the in-flight interactions. Uh, now we have some time for a couple of questions or comments. Uh, any comments are, are welcome, uh, coming from the audience. And if you want, you can take one of the microphones around in order to make the comments or ask the question. Uh, great talk. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, real-time reconstruction technology. Can you briefly describe how in real time the reconstruction is so accurately done, three centimeter level accuracy, three centimeter level accuracy. Thank you. Yeah, of course, I think uh, reconstruction is shown since a while. There's a lot of research uh, which has been done in this field. Now the question is, can you do it real time and what uh, accuracy is needed? I think you need on one side really a very precise um, localization system where you have you don't need um, dense but you need precise motion and there is this all this technology was also developed for virtual and augmented reality helps a lot they also need very precise motion estimation and then actually you need the calculation power and i think the a lot of our robotics technology um, was all of a sudden possible because we have now much better cameras we had also much more calculation power um, uh, which uh, allows to do this and so uh, it's it's feasible to do this in real time um, as long as you have all the elements together and and one thing we are working or we did a lot of work on is synchronization because you for most nation animation you have imu combined with probably other some uh, additional sensors and and cameras and you have to have a very very precise synchronized signal Otherwise, you are fusing information from a, a wrong time slot. So synchronization is probably one of the most critical issues to be more precise at the end. Uh, all right. Well, um, another, another small question related to the problem. So I can see you generated a very dense uh, reconstruction. There's a multi view stereo thing. Uh, can, can you point me to the algorithm or the method that you have used? Yeah, so in principle, we, uh, probably you can just look up our pub, uh, publications, um, and otherwise you can quickly ask me in the in the break. I can point you yeah. to the right place. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Roland Speaker. Um, very good talk. And I have a question regarding, like, kind of general question. So you're talking about like the, the lot of functionality of the robotics, locomotion, uh, uh, localization, mapping, and planning. So in your mind, how you think this thing can be combined to, for example, into a network, or you're thinking the, this kind of like separate modality or modularization of those function uh, can be still used like a better value than compared to like nowadays and people are trying and to an approach to doing everything together. Thank you. Yeah, so you're probably touching at, at, a, at a point where they, we could even start a fundamental discussion. My personal view is that you should not integrate everything because there is different elements. And for all these elements, you at one point, you would like to have an explicit, explicit re representation for the plan, for the 3D map, and so on. Uh, only if you think, for example, if you want to speak with a robot, you want to give them uh, some indications where to move, you need explicit information about the 3D environment. And I think it's much easier also to bring these all elements together. So you can actually, um, of course, uh, we, what we do, we, we try really to have a 3D uh, reconstruction by using all the information. And then, of course, you can add, we are also working, which I didn't show here, on um, uh, segmentation and classification. And there, for example, learning can help a lot to segment the environment or the, your 3D reconstruction um, so that you can go to with sem semantic information of the environment. But first, you need a 3D reconstruction. As mentioned, I think there is a lot of engineering work also and develop R&D needed to have a precise, which depends on the uh, sensor flow input, uh, synchronization, and all these elements. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I would like to ask some question about the wing tra, if that's okay. Yeah, I would like to ask to uh, how what is the maximum height it can fly, and will the control software be modifiable or not? Yeah, so the Wingtra is, if, of course, a company which is now um, selling these platforms um, as an entire product. So the control software is not uh, directly modifiable. So it's an entire package where you have, in a very easy way, so you just have an interface, uh, some of, somewhat an initial tablet, where you actually define where to fly, how you want to fly, and then uh, up it goes. Um, uh, the height is in principle not limited. Uh, of course, uh, you probably will never fly at, at uh, 10,000 meters. And there, I think it would be a somewhat limited because then the air density becomes lower. But uh, quite often you fly at, at heights of, of about 100, 200 meters so that you have an optimal resolution with your cameras so that you most often you want to do a 3D reconstruction. It's used in, in farming, but also a lot of um, in, in um, really capturing information from uh, construction sites, for example. Um, and there you fly at 100 meters or even less. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Professor, for the very interesting talk. Um, we've seen all these, I mean, you talked about all these improvements in the technical field and what we can do today with drones and also the great efforts you made to have them actually come to the general public, like with the companies and spin-offs. Are there any challenges in terms of regulations to actually like have them like massively implemented in society? Yes. I think there is a couple of, of uh, uh, regulations, but also actually the society has to decide what to do. I, I personally think we will probably never have uh, drones delivering goods to our private homes because th there will be noise, noisy. And I, sometimes I feel a lot of people forget about the physics. If you want to be efficient with a rotary wing aircraft, be it small or big, it will be noisy. And one might be okay but if you have 100 flying around you your office place every day then probably you don't want them anymore there is also the question of efficiency but there is a lot of places where it absolutely makes sense in re remote areas where actually it's even more efficient to fly there with a reasonable big airplane to deliver goods because um, the roads are bad you have to move around a lot of uh, um, uh, streets. In some areas you have even no streets. In Switzerland, this is the case for Al Alpine huts, where they have to have goods up there. In Africa, it's sometimes in really little villages which, which have no um, direct access. And there, I think, we, it uh, can be extremely helpful. And of course, this integration in the public airspace will become more and more a, a critical issue. Um, there is a lot of countries which uh, start to have more rigid uh, in uh, yeah, limitation for for drones because you don't want a big aircraft with uh, hundreds of people in uh, crashing because there is a drone going into their, in their, their engines so we need this um, sense in the void for example so that these systems are not really colliding there is one simple way that you have receiver and sender um, which uh, is already in most cases good enough but then uh, you still have in the the air sometimes hang gliders or parachutists and they have also to be seen by drones so that you don't have collision. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm, I have a question about the tilt rotors that you introduced. Um, you talked about the disparity of the uh, dynamic uh, bandwidth of the rotation of the tilt rotors and the dynamics of the rotors themselves. Um, oftentimes you still do quasi-static motion with these tilt rotors, um, which sort of disables them in that they don't get the same kind of agility as their fixed rotor counterparts. Do you think we can overcome this and get a similar agility in the tilt rotor system? And if yes, what do you think should be the approach to get there? Yes, I'm, I'm convinced that you can do the same thing. Of course, this is not the main goal. You 
colleague of mine, uh, David Escaramuza, is doing this very fast flight for Danem. But in most situations, you don't have to be ex as fast. But in principle, we are over con uh, overactuated with these tilt rotors, meaning that you have a potential of optimization. So you can actually have the, the turning, the tilting of the rotors is sl slow, probably nearly an order of mag magnitude slower than the rotational speed change. But you can actually imagine that you have already the system already tilted in situation. So the first thing you do is, is changing the rotational speed. Um, and then in parallel, you slowly move to this, the new situation. And for this, you have to have a, a even more precise model of the whole system and you have to optimize. And I think there, um, reinforced le learning can help a lot in order to find the best uh, a movement, um, which is actually an optimization uh, to follow a certain trajectory. Uh, I don't see any reason why you should not be as good as, as another system. Of course, if you only want to go for high speed, this tilt rotor is extra weight. So this will actually be always there, but it gives you also a lot of extra capabilities and performance for doing very specific maneuvers, which you cannot do with a, with a fixed tilting of the rotors. Thank you very much. Okay, it's time to, uh, to close the session. Uh, so I had a couple of questions that I was going to question about the validation of uh, certification with uh, to Roland, but after that. So we have to move to the next speaker and thank you for to Roland and thank you to the audience. Thanks very much. <laughs>